At 0430 on the 25th of April in 1915, at a beachhead near Gallipoli, the Anzac legend was born. What those men did not know about was this, the AE-2. The AE-2 and the AE-1, Australia's first submarines, arrived just before World War I. The AE-1 was deployed to New Guinea, where it was lost without trace in September 1914. This is a replica of the AE-2, now on display at the Western Australian Maritime Museum in Fremantle. It was the beginning of a century of Australian submarines. Setting out from Albany, Lieutenant Commander Henry Stoker and 34 crewmen reached the Mediterranean. He was then ordered to join the British submarines patrolling the Dardanelles. Undaunted by the failure of earlier attempts to penetrate the heavily mined straits and threaten Turkish forces, Stoker was ordered to attempt to breach the Dardanelles and then to run amok. All previous attempts had failed due to a four-knot current flowing out into the Mediterranean. The AE-2 escaped mines, shore batteries, searchlights and Turkish warships to pass through the straits where no one had succeeded before. It made possible the impossible and other Allied submarines soon followed. Stoker had discovered a countercurrent below 100 feet depth. AE-2 and subsequent Allied submarines penetrated the Dardanelles using this current. Sadly, the AE-2 was lost just five days later. But the end result was 210 enemy vessels sunk or badly damaged. After World War I, the British government gave six J-class submarines to the Australian Navy. With a surface speed of 18 knots, they were the fastest submarines afloat, but they arrived in poor condition. During 1919, they were refitted and a submarine base established at Geelong. But in 1924, deteriorating economic conditions and high maintenance costs ended the second attempt to create an effective submarine arm to the Australian Navy. The J-class submarines were sold as scrap and their hulls were scuttled with the last, the J-7, in 1930. In June 1927, HMAS Otway and HMAS Oxley Modified British O-class submarines were commissioned, but poor timing again reared its ugly head. Reaching Sydney in 1929, their arrival coincided with the Great Depression. As part of the 1930 London Naval Treaty, the Oxley and the Otway were given back to Britain in 1931, thus ending the third attempt to establish a submarine fleet within the Australian Navy. When World War II erupted, the US Asiatic Submarine Force, faced with untenable situations in the Philippines and Java, headed to Fremantle in March 1942. They were quickly joined by 10 Netherlands submarines from Surabaya. The Fremantle submarine base would alter the course of the Second World War. In 1944, British submarines joined the base. From 1942 until the end of the war, 165 Allied submarines were based out of Fremantle. Despite comprising only 1.5% of the Allied naval forces, these Fremantle-based submarines sank almost 60% of the enemy's vessels during the Pacific War. From 1945 to 1968, British submarines were based in Australia. But in the late 1950s, the UK government advised that the Royal Navy submarines would be withdrawn. And following a decision in 1963, the first of the British Oberon class, HMAS Oxley, was launched in 1967. The Oberon class were attack submarines with anti-surface and anti-submarine capabilities. Otway arrived in Australia in 1968. This one, the Ovens, in 1969, Onslow in 1970, Orion in 1977, and Atama in 1976. By the mid-80s, 
The Australian submarine arm had become one of the world's most professional, with an unsurpassed level of service. In 1987, the Australian government decided to replace the ageing Oberon fleet. They were decommissioned. The ovens here decommissioned in December 1995. The Collins class evolved. An entirely new type of submarine, these were specifically designed to meet Australia's unique circumstances. Travel great distances, have state-of-the-art weapon systems and perform two ocean surveillance. Totally computer designed, the six Collins class submarines of Collins, Farncombe, Waller, Deshano, Sheehan and Rankin were delivered between 1996 and 2003. They have a high performance hull form, highly automated controls, low indiscretion rates, high shock resistance, efficient weapons handling guided by intelligence gathering sensors and a silent mode using electric power from banks of new tech batteries. Which brings us to the future. Now, you may ask why Australia needs submarines. Well, they provide balance that, as a maritime nation, Australia requires to deter would-be aggressors and help build Australian influence, because our national prosperity depends on continued access to the sea. Submarines operate undetected and exploit the advantage of surprise. They gather a wide range of information while unobserved, and they deliver a very powerful effect from a comparatively small number of personnel. In terms of efficiency, a submarine needs only one-third the crew required for a frigate. Finally, as we've seen, history has taught us their effectiveness in defence. As the future unfolds, it is estimated that Australia needs 12 submarines. Experts suggest Australia should have at least three submarines on permanent patrol in a time of tension or war. That needs three to four submarines for every one on patrol. As the Collins submarines demonstrate, Australia has the capacity to build large, world-class conventional submarines. Only a new design built for the range, endurance and capability that Australia's geography dictates will deliver. Spread over many years, less than 20% of the annual defence sustainment budget is needed and a very high percentage of this will go to employment and further research and development without reliance on foreign inputs and thus contribute to our economy. The Collins submarines will reach the end of their planned life in 2025. The first delivery of replacement vessels must therefore be in 2022 and they'll take eight years to design and build. The Collins program generated several thousand jobs, developed new skills, and above all else, engendered the confidence and competence to take on the future submarine program. That is what we must do now. That is what a hundred years of Australian submarines has taught us.